was an introductory remark <laughs> outside, yeah, <laughs> outside the video. No, anyway, I just repeat for, did you monitor it already or shall I repeat? <laughs> it's fine, okay. <laughs> Sorry, yes. Okay, now I'm uh, talking about how to c determine th these factors or these uh, parameters uh, correctly. And, uh, well, with a J, for instance, in a bimaterial or at a phase boundary or so, has any kind of significance is something I, numerics will not decide. It's important to realize. Anyway, so this is generally on FE meshes, finite element meshes, for structures with cracks, and CTOA, CTUD, stress intensity at J. Anyway, now general to... Uh, finite element models, cracks and crack-like defects always induce high stresses and strain gradients, which re require a fine discretization. And this means a large number of elements and degrees of freedoms. So you should try to reduce the number of degrees of freedom, for instance, by 2D models whenever possible. And you, if starting with a new problem, don't start with a 3D model, please. Start with a 2D model to get some insight on uh, with the problems with it. Uh, cause the mesh remote from the defect. Account for symmetry conditions. And for certain applications, you may apply singular elements with special shape functions. OK. And this is something. I always try to teach one of my colleagues, he did the other way around. Modeling means reduction of complexity and simplification. So your models should be as simple as possible, and as only as complex as unavoidable. And I had a co uh, colleague who always made it as complex as possible. So it's <laughs> this is not the better solution to you because you lose uh, your feeling what your model does if it's that complex. Anyway, but that's important. Now, example, a compact specimen. So, uh, well, this is how it looks like. It's a plain situation anyway. So you can use it as a plain model. Well, depending plain strain, plain stress. Another question. And a uh, complete finite element mesh of that one would look like this one. So you have the uh, um, ligament here and you may have cohesive elements here or whatever, but it's a symmetry line. So what has been done here? Do not care about that one. You have a symmetry line here and you account for that for, by omitting the displacements in the y direction here. But, well, it's even, yeah, that's a symmetry line. You have a displacements zero in two direction here for x1 greater than a and a 2D plane strain model. But this is even too complicated. So these parts are not really necessary. So you don't need that one. This is a dead zone here, dead material. You de do not need this complex modeling of uh, the applied load. And you do not need this one, which is only done in experiments to have a, uh, for, your, for your measuring clip here. So forget about that one, and you end up with this, just a regular um, rectangle. Now, careful. Uh, if you apply a singular load or a displacement, most cases it's a displacement because you have the decreasing load, decreasing load displacement curve, uh, you, will, you may get plastic concentration here. And so what you can do, just choose an, choose an region which you define as elastic, so that just the load is distributed and you do not have a concentration here. You do not care about the stre stresses and strains in that part here, whether they are correct or not. They are definitely correct in that area here due to the principle that in some distance, well, you always get uh, the same solution independent of this area where you apply the load. Anyway, now this will be your model. 
the ligament here, crack tip here, you measure your half of your um, load line opening displacement at that point, which is not different from that one because this, this again, there is no actually, uh, is nearly stress free here. And you apply a displacement in that point here, and that's it. And then you have a displacement controlled calculation. And uh, the boundary conditions, they uh, guarantee your symmetry with for a mode one, of course. Okay, now for a stationary crack at the crack tip, you may use so-called collapsed singular element that form a kind of a centered fan around the crack tip. And you can show that they introduce a certain singularity here, which is of that kind which includes the 1 over square root r and 1 over r for the displacement field, plus constant here, if you use this kind of collapsed elements here. And they are good for really reliably computing stress and strain fields at the crack tip for a non-growing crack. Now, if the crack is extending to whatever, to a node release technique, to cohesive elements, to a um, damage model or whatever, then you cannot use this one because you need to have a regular arrangement of elements so that the crack tip always meets the same conditions. So you just have quadratic square elements along that line and the stresses immediately at the crack tip, that means that the first or one or two elements will not be very reliably. So uh, don't depend on them. But again, this is meant to be mo model to model the extension of a crack by whatever model, a J-controlled node release, a uh, cohesive element or so. So you have these kind of modeling possibilities with, with elements here. This fan here with singular elements, this one, a regular array of elements for an extending crack. Now, in this case, you have a bi-actually loaded center crack panel. You have a two-fold symmetry along that one and that one, so this would be your metal. You also see the, again, see the refinement here. So this is uh, your crack length, A sub zero. You have boundary conditions here and here, and you apply external load or better displacement on the surfaces here. So this is a double symmetry, a two-fold symmetry. A little bit more complicated, you see this is um, you, a, tubular, a tubular joint. Um, was used in an ESIS round robin by Cornick and others. It has one symmetry plane, at least here. The crack is actually at uh, the intersection of the tube uh, the two tubes here, two, the two cylinders here. And it's important, of course, you, you have to have a fine mesh here, but you don't need it here. So the meshing is actually rather complicated, but you cannot model the whole thing with the same mesh as close to the crack tip. So uh, this is uh, how it was done, refining the mesh with um, approximation to the crack, which is here. Now, this is something where no symmetry existed at all. This is a railway axle. And, um, well, you can read something about it here in this publication by Zerbs and others. And it uh, was uh, applied and used in um, ESIS TC24 on um, railway axles and presented there in 2005. You need a full 3D model, actually, in this case because there is no symmetry plane and you have loading by tension, bending and torsion. And well, you can have cracks in different places, usually somewhere there or outside here. So these are cracks, kind of these cracks, which you have here. And again, of course, you coarsen your mesh moving away from the defect. I'll uh, show you uh, examples of K-factor for this one. 
uh, the idea behind this is this was a uh, elastic analysis. You have forces here and here. You have cracks somewhere, and it's rotating. So the um, so question is, how does a crack develop? Fatigue crack analysis of that one. You need k factors for this analysis. OK. Now, crack tip opening displacement. This is something which can be used only, I think, for a crack tip blunting like this. Then you mean you have your centered elements around the crack tip here. They open in a large strain analysis and blunt and give uh, a round profile here. And somewhere here, depending on the definition, you get half of your CTOD. You can use the uh, Xi assumption of the 45 degree angle. You can use any kind of uh, you want. And as you have the analysis, you can decide later. You first make the calculations and decide how, what to develop, uh, uh, what to um, define as CTOD. Uh, here, collapsed elements with a 1 over R singularity have been used. And it was an elastoplastic large strain. That means a geometrical nonlinear analysis. You see, if you want to have CTOD and J at the same time, then you have to do a large strain analysis, and then you have to account for the question, how path dependent is my J, and which one of the several contours will give you my J, which I actually can compare to experimental values. Now, in a CTOA controlled crack extension, as it was modeled here, uh, well, this angle here is CTOA, and the uh, criterion just tells you which is used in, uh, for panels in airplane industry or so that uh, in a stationary movement of the crack, CTOA keeps constant. And you can easily apply this in an analysis for a crack growth analysis. Regular isoparametric elements have been applied and also a large strain analysis, and this is half half of the angle here. Okay. Okay, I've shown that already, so I needn't explain that anymore. Uh, at the blunted crack, this was the crack distribution. You've seen the blunting now, and this is the respective distribution of stresses here. And actually, though using incremental theory of plasticity and though using a large strain in analysis, which accounts for corrective blunting, you get a finite regime of an HRR dominated zone of the stress field here. Now, a CTUA controlled crack extension, you see on uh, what I said before, the crack tip blunts, then you have an initiation, and then the crack extends under a constant CTUA. This is something which can be found in experiments. The determination of uh, the angle in experiments is comparably difficult. I will not get into details, but better you combine an experiment with a numerical analysis and then fit the angle to <laughs> until it fits your experimental values because your scatter of the angle as measured in experiments is too large. Anyway, okay, so there is uh, another point of um, how you can determine your crack opening angle, I call C R, and have something like an R curve for this angle, depending on delta A. Uh, it can be derived from, um, is it here? From an R curve. I don't find the equation here. Okay, well, if you have a measured a CTOD R curve, then this C is actually the um, uh, the derivative of CTOD with respect to delta A. And this has been approximated by some kind of power law, uh, as you see here. So in the first part, you have a decreasing value of CTOA, and then you have a stationary value here. And this is what you can obtain, or what you can measure from a CTOD R curve. And, well, this one you better... Um, fit to the glow to some global kind of experimental values. 
after you see um, after um, transient regime, you reach a constant CTUD, and the transient regime is determined by the derivative. Here it is, derivative of a delta five R curve. Delta five is a Swalbe definition of a five millimeters uh, measurement of CTUD ahead of the crack tip. On uh, the uh, stationary value, you may obtain from simulating a F over load line displacement curve or a delta 5 R curve and then fit uh, the parameter there. And I've, as now I show you later, you've seen the, um, uh, go back to that one. You see this is the, uh, this was done, this was done with the CTUA controlled crack rails. Anyway, okay, now, well, you simulated by node release and in Abacus, you can use the uh, so-called debond option, option, fracture criterion type equals CTOD, COD, and uh, your CTOA is COD over some kind of base length here, one millimeter. You define it with an, an Abacus. Uh, in our case, it was taken as one millimeter, and as the ele element length was 0.25 millimeters, it's uh, over four elements what it was taken here. The result will depend on that. I'll show you later. And so you do not have to change it, and you shouldn't change it from one, from one specimen to the other. Always keep the same one. So that's what it says. CTUA is dependent on the base length. It has to be uniquely defined in both testing and FE simulation. If you determine CTUA from, the, from testing, optical um, photos, then you have to use the same element length. Now, the same base length. So you see, that's how we can validate uh, this curve here. Th the dots are experimental values for an empty specimen. I think the material was some kind of aluminum alloy. And um, then uh, base length was changed from one element base length to four elements base length, and this is that one. And if you can fit this curve and you see for uh, just taking one element, you get this curve and that one, you approach finally to, the, to that one. And uh, this can, can then be used to be applied to other geometries. I'll show you some examples later, but that's how uh, uh, analysis with CTOA control crack rays can work. Now, how to calculate stress intensity factors? This was on CTOD and CTOA down. Now come to stress intensity factors. Actually, they are defined as this. They are the limit values for R approaching zero of the opening stresses, the shear stresses, the in-plane shear stresses, the out-of-plane shear stresses for the three modes. That's how it has been done in earlier times. Usually this is uh, not a very reliable procedure as your stress distribution is, uh, well, questionable sometimes, depending on your uh, mesh you have used and um, everything. So uh, very often people use this one instead because, uh, well, they have some kind of singularity. The displacements do not have so they become better calculating from the displacement fields. On the other hand, the displacement field depends on whether you assume a plane strain or a plane stress. And in a 3D situation, you don't know. So, well, if you made a plane strain analysis, it's fine. But if you have a 3D analysis, you do not use, know whether to use this one or that one. Anyway, that's not how, you have a question? What? Really? This is not, no, the displacement field itself is not singular. No. So this, yeah, yeah, this is not singular. Uh, well, this is one over R. This is not singular. That is why the results, the finite element results, are more correct for displacements than for that one. Thank you. Yeah, that's what I meant. Anyway, uh, that's not how it is done anymore. You can use the energy release rate with this 
equation here. If you have a pure mode one, again, plane stress or plane strain is a question. And the energy release rate, okay, this can be calculated in Abacus and other programs by the so-called virtual crack extension method. You see, um, energy release rate means how does the energy of the structure changes if the crack extends by a small amount. Now in a finite element calculation, you do it virtually, that's what we call virtual crack extension, you extend it numerically and you calculate the change of energy. And you get some um, value of the energy release rate and the interesting thing is now if you do not do it just in the x1 direction then you will get it for mode 1. You can uh, do it in some arbitrary direction and you get your energy release for the crack extending in any kind of angle with respect to the ligament. Mode 1 or whatever this is. The crack deviates there. You get values here and it's for phi equals zero, this is your J1, the conventional J, which is this one, and phi equals one half of pi, that means 90 degrees, you obtain your J2, the second component of the J integral vector, which was uh, minus two K1, K2 over E prime. Now, as I said before, if you resolve this equation, these two equations, you end up, this is a fourth order one, you end up uh, with more than one solution because this is plus minus this one. And then you need some additional consideration to find out what is you know, actually K1. If you are at K1, then you can calculate K2, of course. So this is possible, but needs some kind of additional consideration to decide which of those to take. Okay, for just considering G1, besides the virtual crack extension, there's another method. I think it's also in Abacus. It is called the virtual crack closure integral. Okay, if for uh, energy is released for a crack extension, a virtual one, then if you close it, minus of the same value you'll get as energy release rate. And so... Uh, you just make some additional assumptions which stresses and, st and displacement fields to, to use. And then you can calculate here G1 here. It's just the opposite of crack extension. It's, it's just closing it virtually and calculating the difference in energy. I think it's also in virtual crack extension is also in abacus, is it? I, th I think, yeah, maybe, VCCI. Anyway, but I don't know, uh, having J in Abacus, it doesn't need that one. Because in elasticity, in elasticity, J is quite clear. There's no path dependence and everything's fine. So in elasticity, you can just use as it is and do not have to use anything else but J in uh, Abacus. Now, I come... Uh, now to the uh, realization of these integrals, quantum or domain integrals, which is actually used uh, with the same meaning, synonymously. Um, in Abacus Theory Manual 11, uh, it tells you that Abacus Standard offers the evaluation of several parameters for fractional mechanics, the J integral, the C star integral, that is uh, for viscoplasticity, for time-dependent creep, behavior, stress intensity factors, as says, I said, they calculate everything correctly, but don't rely on the uh, comments and on it. It said, it's to measure the strength of the local crack tip fields. I have no idea what the strength of a crack tip field is. A material can have a, a fracture strength or something like that, or a yield strength or something, but a uh, field, a stress field cannot have a strength and doesn't have. Anyway, um, then the crack propagation 
direction, that is the angle at, in, at which a pre-existing pre crack will propagate. We shall not talk on this one, but of course, I mean, there's a lot of theory on that one. So be sure which one you use in Abacus if you apply this one. Abacus will, of course, always calculate something. And it's your responsibility to decide whether this is significant or not. So things are very clear with respect to J and C star and stress intensity factor. And T stress can also be calculated. But uh, the uh, correct propagation direction needs, needs a physical criterion again. All the others are based on constitutive equations and geometry and everything like that. There is no more physics behind. But in that one, the physical criterion on crack path deviation is in the program. And you have to make clear which one it is. Anyway, uh, so I will mainly talk on the two ones, J and stress intensity factors, not on T stress. OK, there's something again. Uh, it says T stress represents uh, whatever and used as an indicator of the extent to which parameters like the J integral are useful characterizations of the deformation fields around the crack. I don't know what this means. But forget about it. The result is correct. Anyway, OK, now using the divergence theorem, the contour integral can be, well, not expanded, but it can be converted, can be converted, it's divergence theorem, Gauss theorem, into an area integral. And this is uh, then called the domain integral method. And this is used to collect, to calculate contour integrals within Abacus. That is why both contour integral or domain integral is used, because due to the divergence theorem, this is equivalent. And there are reasons for it not to using the contour integral, but using the domain integral, because the energy is calculated in the elements and not stresses in singular Gauss points or so, which would have to be calculated in a contour integral. So the, using the domain integral method yields much more reliable results. Anyway, now stress intensity factors in Abacus, they use the so-called interaction integral method, which she and Asaro um, introduced in 1988, which holds for isotropic and anisotropic linear materials. And if you have a matrix of your k factors like this one, k1, k2, k3, then your energy release rate can be written like this, k transposed times some matrix b to the minus 1 times k. And for isotropic material, you see you have just this one, e prime, e prime, 2g, which gives the, rela the relation I've shown before. OK, now, if you calculate like this in general, then it would look like this one. These are only the terms uh, which contain k1 here. k1, k1. And there are six others which contain k2 and k3, but not k1. So I just use this part just to make it shorter. And now you superimpose a so-called auxiliary corrective field, in this case a mode 1, because you want to calculate k1, like this one. k1 times b11 minus 1 k1 is superimposed. That's just the first component of that one with some other k, an auxiliary one. And particularly, you take this k as 1. Then your total j of these two fields will be that one. And now the interaction integral is the total one minus this j minus this auxiliary one. And this is that one. OK. And this gives you the same for alpha equal 2 and 3 for mode 1 and mode 2. You see, this is a simple one only for the first mode, just from the total one, which, 
includes everything, minus is, um, uh, this one, the total one, and this auxiliary one. And from this equation, Abacus calculates k for the three different modes, just separating the three different modes. OK, so uh, now k is assigned as unit values. Then means it is equal 1. Then j integral is a vector like this one for mode 1, mode 2, mode 3. And your respective j alpha, 1, 2, and 3, is this equation here. This is calculated from the domain integral method. And k1 is equal 1. And your auxiliary collective field, therefore, is, uh, of course, this angular function for mode 1, 2, and 3 over square root of 2 pi r. This is the analytic solution which you introduce. And this k, as I said before, is equal 1. Now, there is one problem with it. I do not understand why this should be the limit of gamma to 0. We have elasticity. j is path independent. So there is no limit. Uh, there is no necessity of calculating it the limit gamma to 0. It's even counterproductive, because discretization errors even become larger if you go gamma to 0. So forget about that one. And um, well, I will talk about contour dependence of k, which is now, in this case, there is no uh, material influence, but a discretization influence. So that's my comment on it, that comments on path dependence in the abacus manually, manual are generally disputable, to say it in a very kind way. <laughs> OK. Uh, abacus tells you the stress intensity factors have the same domain independence features as a J integral. No. I mean, in elasticity, this is true, because J and K is in elasticity. But in plasticity, the path dependence is a question of incremental theory of plasticity. And here, in elasticity, is a question on uh, discretization. In plasticity, you will have both, of course. But uh, it's not actually the same. And so the um, question how to deal with it is different in elasticity and plasticity. That's what I said. Pass or domain dependent generally has two reasons. Numerical errors due to discretization and violation of the physical conditions for path independence, namely the assumption of a hyperelastic material in elastic plaster fracture mechanics. So don't mix that. The former occurs in the determination of stress intensity factors in LEFM, the latter mainly in the calculation of an elastoplastic J. So don't confuse that. I mean, these, these people are not supposed to be fracture mechanics experts. They should do their job as for good programming and mathematics and so on. And they did do this. But then they should either not write anything or ask somebody. That's my point, because, I mean, uh, I even have seen in publications, scientific publications, that people are uh, referencing text from the abacus manual. And if I said, well, this is wrong, I, the, the author will write to me, well, but this is how it's uh, written in the abacus manual. When I, and I only say them the abacus manual is no scientific publication. Be sure if you have the right values, but don't care about what's written on theory there. Anyway, now, example, railway axle. As I've shown you before, uh, you have uh, horizontal and vertical forces on these places here. And actually, what has been calculated, the crack is here. So it's a semi-elliptical uh, crack here of depth A and length to C. And this is the axle here. Uh, OK. And now, well, this, the whole thing is turning. 
the forces change uh, their values, the crack change changes its position, but of course you ha have elasticity, so you can superimpose all that one. So whenever you have one solution for one horizontal force here and vertical force here and here and here, then you always superimpose by uh, calculating the uh, time variation via the time variation of these forces. Anyway, so I'm just presenting the numbers for a configuration like this one for the different... So this was the final element structure as I've shown before. Anyway, so this is the vertical force number one. Uh, the blue one is a contour number one, and further contours, two, three, and four, are the other ones. You see, number one is definitely path dependent. This is a discretization error. On the other hand, there is some problem here. You may obtain, obtain arbitrary values here at the free surface. Uh, I will a bit later come to the reason of that because it's, there are two reasons actually. First, um, at the intersection of a crack with a free surface, there is not exactly the one over square root r singularity. This uh, results from theory already. So theory is not valid here. Anyway, the other way is, uh, the other reason is, the crack penetrates the surface, not rectangularly. So the question is, what is the crack extension direction which you use here? So what I would personally, and what I suggested my colleague, from which I got this value here, Manfred Schödel, what to use here, what I would do is actually extrapolate this one to the final, to the free servers and take this value, because the other is good for nothing. You can have any value, and there is no, no really saturation value here. Anyway, what do you get? A reasonable path independence. Now, this is for K2, this was K1, this is for K2 again. This one is, well, very path dependent, but this is fine now. And again, here the values are, I don't know where. Is, I would suggest using this one, just extrapolate it here. And this is for uh, K3. You see, this is a case as you have bending, torsion, and normal forces, where you have in-plane shear, out-of-plane shear, torsion, and opening, where you really need all three components or all three stress-intensity factors and not just restrict to one. Anyway, now uh, the, virtual, uh, the vertical force t in point two, well, it's getting critical here. Strong path dependence. I don't really have a recommendation which value to take because there seems to be no saturation or limit value of that one. So please don't ask me. I don't know what Manfred in the end did, but and wh what the reason is. We didn't investigate it further. There, it's nice here, because this is, OK, seems to be some kind of path independence here, but values here and no idea. Uh, but it's important. If you calculate just one contour and take the values, you're not aware what can be wrong with these values? At least you know something is wrong. What you decide to do is your point, up, but you should know what is wrong. Anyway, this is better for K2. Again, you have this surface effect here. And, uh, okay. And K3 is the same situation. There's actually no limit value for K, which you calculate from Abacus. This is not a fault of abacus. It's somehow related to uh, the problem and the mesh, most likely the mesh here. But uh, I don't know. Uh, Manfred, who gave me these values, did this long ago, and I don't know how they actually solved that problem. Now this is for the horizontal force one. Fine again for path independence. Surface effects again, OK path independence here or, well, I mean, uh, 
values aren't that big anyway here. So which one to take? I don't know. There's not really a set duration or limit value here. Now, horizontal force two, this one. Yeah, well, did I make a bar through it? Look at that. They are negative. Negative k values, k1, particularly with mean crack closure. There is no k at all. So for a static analysis, please don't use this. Crack closure does not exist, so they are not physically meaningful. However, if you make a um, fatigue analysis, and you're calculating the change of k1, delta k. Uh, some people even, even use this one. Others use a zero value. But this is, again, something on the physical significance, what to use in the Paris law for delta k. If you use a minimum value which is negative, or if you use a minimum value which is zero. It's not my, well decision to do that. I just have to figure out, be careful, what's happening here. Uh, OK, K2. So fine again. You see, always the first contour is not uh, useful for anything. And the surface values <coughs> always undergo a strange uh, behavior here. And this is uh, K3 here. Anyway, now J integral and abacus. So in abacus, uh, Manual 2, on the 16.1, you find that this definition of J, a contour integral beginning at the bo bottom crack surface and ending on the top surface. The limit indicates that K shrinks onto the crack tip. That will be a remark later. Q is a unit vector in the virtual crack extension direction. And N is the outward normal to gamma. So in the contour integral, I don't know what the crack extension direction is. Now, in Abacus 11.4, they give this definition of J, which mainly looks like that one. Expect this lambda here. Expect this lambda here, yeah. OK, and the definition they give as an energy release rate associated with crack advance. Uh, well, so something odd definition, what a three-dimensional fracture is, but I have some idea what I mean. Um, DA is a surface element along a vanishing, vanishing small tubular surface. I don't know what a surface element along a tubular surface is, by the way, uh, which encloses a crack tip. Anyway. So if you look at the two, you will find that in two different parts of the Ambicus manual, they give different definitions. And this is a mixture of contour integral and domain integral, actually. So uh, remember, the contour integral was this one. There is no need for Q, for virtual crack extension here. That's how it looks like. That's a contour integral. So. Well, you don't need a Q there. The rest is quite fine, yeah. Now, in the domain integral, you have an assumption on a virtual crack extension and calculate J from this one. Uh, except, well, there are a few things. You see, if you look at that, there is a minus sign between the two. Plus, minus, pl minus, plus. Here, the integrant is the same here. So something is wrong with this. They do it correctly in the calculation, or how, however they define the, the values, but the equation is not correct. OK? And uh, also the denominator, that is the amount of crack extension, this delta A crack, is missing in that one. So in some minor equation few, few times later, they write, OK, JP, JP plus J is JP bar over the integral over the uh, um, shape functions of the elements, yes. Well, this actually gives you <laughs> the correct plane, they, but they should write it in the, uh, 
equation. And the second point is vanishingly small and get gamma shrinks into the crack tip. Either J is path independent, as it's supposed to be, and which holds an elasticity, it's not necessary to go to the crack tip. And it's a, in the case of plasticity, uh, it's even worse, because then uh, it's strongly path dependent. So there is no need at all to restrict it to a vanishingly small path or shrink to the crack tip or something like that. This ignores fundamentals of the J integral concept. J is and has to be a far field quantity, which under certain, I repeat that, which under certain conditions controls the near field. Uh, I've seen again publications where people calculated several contours for J. What they were doing in the end, because they didn't know what to do with it, they took an average value. No idea. This is what, if people who can uh, operate a finite element program try to do fracture mechanics. They have no idea what they're doing. And if they got several values, oh, okay, they learned in school, sometimes you take, you have scatter, you take an average value or whatever. So this is c complete nonsense at that time. But this, and I mean, this is a publication I have seen and which I could reject. I'm pretty sure there exist others where this is done. When the, where the uh, uh, person doing the revision did not have a look on that one. Anyway, now, if, yeah, for elastic material, W is this elastic strain energy. So I go to the uh, comments already. It's a strain energy density, actually. Uh, for and uh, in plastic dissipation, and strain energy in equivalent elastic material. An equivalent elastic material, I don't know what this is, it's actually hyperelastic material, what they mean. And um, the integral is suitable only for monotonic loading. This is a necessary but not a sufficient condition. Of course, if you have unloading, the whole concept will not work. But even under monotonic loading, you may have local real arrangement of stresses in plasticity. This spoils the assumption of a, a hyperelastic material. OK, domain dependence. Well, the only condition they give is that the crack faces are parallel to each other. Uh, but J integral estimates may vary because of the approximate nature of the finite element solution. That's not the reason. There is a physical reason before as I said before, which is uh, incremental theory of plasticity and, and, and dissipation of energy. A strong variation in these estimates, con commonly called domain dependence, typically indicates an error in the contour integral definition. It's nonsense. Uh, well, I mean, this whole paragraph, this is what I can only call garbage. A gradual variation may indicate a finer mesh is needed. No. <laughs> it's counterproductive. If you have a finer mesh, you get more contour. You need more contours to reach a far field value. Anyway, the equivalent elastic material is not a good representation. OK, I mean, with that one, they indicate that uh, the assumption of uh, hyperelastic material is violated. That's what it's supposed to say. Yeah. That's my comments on this. Uh, so the approximate nature holds for linear elastic fracture mechanics, but it's not the reason for uh, elastic plastic J. I don't know what kind of error, or is it? Error in the contour definition. I don't know what kind of error. What is strong and what is gradual? And equivalent elastic is, of course, hyperelastic material. So um, this continues. Since it is not always possible to include the plastic zone in three dimensions, this is, may also occur in 2D, of course, on the large plane, and uh, large scale yielding. Uh, a finer mesh may be the only solution. 
This is rubbish, I said. A finer mesh does not change the size of the plastic zone. Mesh refinement is commonly counterproductive in plasticity and may make things worse. To check the accuracy, well, this is not a question of accuracy, but a question of physics, of dissipation of energy in plasticity. And there's one right sentence. The contour integral values that are not approximately equal to this constant should be discarded. So absolutely, it indicates that a far field value is needed. So please, whenever you use a J integral, never use a near field value or something in between or whatever. The near field values do not have any physical significance. Only the far field value is at least comparable to what you measure in the experiments. And whether this is a quantity which, can, uh, which is useful for a fracture assessment is a different question, but there are a lot of cases where this can be done. <coughs> OK. So you can find more here in a presentation we made in Materialprüfung. So it's in German a news, uh, not newspaper, <laughs> scientific paper, uh, journal. It's in English. At that time, when we made all this one um, and made a report of this, and then the editor of Materialprüfung told us, well, do you want to publish it? I said, this is old stuff. We did this 10 years ago in the 90s. Well, he said, there is still a necessity. And uh, I received several nice comments on that one that they said they found it useful to read it. But actually, for 2003, it's much too late. Everything is known from the 90s, at least. Anyway. J calculation, well, it uses the domain integral method, uh, as I said before. And each contour or domain provides an evaluation of the contour integral, and the number of contours must be specified by this kind of uh, line. In uh, Abaca CAE, you will put in, have to put in this, but I prefer this one because it uh, tells you what is actually done. Uh, anyway, um, and you can edit it later in the file. Uh, then you have to define the crack front, and you have to def specify the virtual crack extension direction. Defining the crack front. Uh, this is uh, the region that defines the first contour, if you use the option of automatic contours here. Abacus standard uses this region and one layer of elements surrounding it to compute the first contour integral, if you do not specify the first contour differently. Um, by default, Abacus defines the crack tip as a node specified for the crack front and the so-called crack tip nodes of the uh, contour integral definition. So you have to do this. This is for 3D. You have a, a whole uh, crack front. In 2D, it's just one point. Alternate, alternatively, a user-defined node set can be used, as, which has to include the crack tip which can be provided to Abacus by omitting the crack tip node option, contour integral, contours equal n, and then you spy the crack front node set in spe despite the uh, crack tip node, which facilitates your business quite a lot because uh, you can choose a large contour already. So there is no significant path dependence anymore. I'll show you examples later. So in 3D, this is the meaning of the um, quantities. And note that n now is this normal to the crack front and not that n which is in the definitions before of the outer surface normal of the contour integral. Anyway, and q is perpendicular to the crack front. This is a tangential direction to the crack front. And this is a normal to 1. OK, and you can define the normal to the crack plane using the so-called normal option by that one. And then 
uh, Abacus will calculate a virtual crack extension Q that is orthogonal to the crack front tension T and the normal N. That means, in this case, you do not have to define this, but there are alternatives where you can uh, define Q anyway. The normal option can be used only if the crack is flat. That's clear, but it's important to mention. Anyway, now the virtual crack extension direction can be di defined directly by this option. Now, there is a problem I was discussing before. If you have a surface floor, the normal obviously is the direction in which a node of the crack front will extend and move in a crack extension, a virtual crack extension. But at the free surface, the normal may not be the correct one, but the, crack, the actual crack will extend in this way. So in this case, one might use the definition of Q with this direction and look what happens, what is the value. It has not been done before in the values I was showing. Um, what is the correct VCE direction, Q1 or Q2? And see the results above. In this case, at least if you have this problem, I would recommend that you do both. This is the automatic which Abacus does and do this one and then see what comes out. I don't know. But anyway, that's, that's your choice then. Okay, you can also use a symmetry option. Uh, then just the J integral is taken twice. The potential energy is doubled because you have an upper and a lower half of your one. Now, example, again, this CT specimen um, with this um, finite element mesh, plain strain. Now, in the automatic option from Abacus, the first contour is a crack tip here. The last contour is number 24. That means in between you have 24 ones. You may see it better in your lecture notes, which is this one here. But this is absolutely not necessary here to have this one. But anyway, this is done automatically because from the first one, Abacus increases and increases the number of element rings around that one. So you will have um, 24 contours to get actually in the far field. Don't use any one which is on the surface because these elements here uh, in the first row beyond that one are used for calculating the energy. And if this boundary is on the free surface, there is no ring, so it gives you garbage. OK, now the manual option. Let's say you define a first contour as node set, like this one. And then you get the same result in of the far field with 12 contours. And you avoid all this one here. So this is your contour number 12 for this option, starting with that one. Now, interesting to see the plastic zone size. This is at a um, load line displacement of one millimeter. And the 11th contour of the automatic option, uh, it goes like this here. So this includes the plastic zone around the crack tip. In the manual option, OK. The same displacement, the third contour after that one. You see, you have this one already, which perfectly includes the uh, plastic zone. So you expect that the third contour here will give you a quite good value. Here, you need at least 11 ones. And well, that's the result. So uh, this is for the crack tip, the first note. And the um, automatic optician at first is the crack tip. And a large straight analysis was used here. And you have the different ones from 11, web well, da da from 11 on, somewhere here, uh, it's approximately path dependent. If you use a manual option, the first contour is a user-defined node set. You see, that's fine. From th number 3 to 12, and even number 1, it's nearly 
the same. And again, yeah, no, let's say the last contour here. And you can uh, nicely uh, use a um, far field J integral from this calculation here. But anyway, please always make a test and a check of the path dependence if you do a J calculation and make sure uh, that you get something where there is no big difference between uh, two or three contours anymore. So this is plotted in the number of contours for the uh, automatic option. You have to use 10 or 11 contours to come here and for the manual definition one from the first on you run to a saturation value. Okay, and here is a comparison with uh, far field J value as calculated from <coughs> ASTM. And you see they are coincident in this one here. And so you also see any other is not useful at all because you want to compare with, with tests, with, with experiments. Whether this J controls your corrective field is a second question, but at least this is a physically significant value which is comparable with the results of the experiments. Now, a surface flaw in a pressure vessel done the same in 3D, like this one. You have two, so this is a pressure <coughs> vessel. You have the surface flaw here, so you have internal pressure here. So this S is along here. This is a normalized crack front coordinate going from zero to one. And what you find here is uh, that you get a maximum of J, not in the center, but here. And this is an interesting thing. If you make a um, safety analysis of the surface flaw in a pressure vessel, you usually use two values because you can find analytical solutions or tabulated solutions for this. One is this one, and the other one is this one to, to make a safety assessment. Very good for nothing because the maximum value of J is this one. And it's somewhere here. You see, and this is actually what happens. So this is a test for crack extension. And that one, maximum crack growth occurs here. And this is around here where maximum of J is. So you have no choice but making your own finite element calculation for a problem like this one. You cannot use all these uh, options in the um, safety assessment codes. Okay, some references. And uh, particularly uh, the path dependence of J and everything like that uh, was uh, done by students in uh, Milano. And the um, course I gave there the final report of the student's project, and you can, can find it, can find more details on that analysis here. Anyway, so I make my second break. Now this time I would say we continue quarter to, quarter to four. Hi.